Okay, everybody, welcome. So, I have a new computer. It's not going to hopefully act up the way the other one did in the spring. So, here we go. Here's our entertainment. Well, I'm sure it was very entertaining to you. It wasn't to me. Yes. So, this is our agenda for the day. Okay, so um, is there anybody here for the very first time? Awesome, one, two, three, perfect. Um, now, to uh, my surnames are Banner, Rupert, Winbow, Walker, White, Moje. I go kind of the Gaspé mm -hmm. and I go Britain. Okay. So, and then on my husband's side, it's Rupert. Yes. So. You're only just doing one line there because eh? he can do his own, right? Oh, gosh, no. He, no. <laughs> he, he knows he's related to people, but everything is up to me. So, yes. I, I spent most of the last 20 years on my own side, but the last maybe four, three or four on this side. You, so you're branching out and giving him some assistance. I am. Very good. Very good. I think that's very generous of you, considering most spouses couldn't be... Oh, well, he couldn't care less. It's for my daughter. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. And the lady beside you? My name is Rosalind Bounty. Uh, my name is Rosalind Bounty. Here, John has a piece of paper that you can go at in the break and put your names down and your contact information. And if we manage to connect you, we'll let you know. So, moving on. Our day of learning is coming up really fast, October 19th. And I just want to give you some more details. Hopefully, you've been reading these details in the e-weekly which you're all subscribed to, right? Mm -hmm. Is there anybody here who doesn't get the e-weekly Saturday mornings? Because I can help you sign up if, if you want to. Um, I really like the e-weekly because you get uh, stuff that's ha happening across Ontario at our branches, but they also put in genealogical news that is interesting or links to blog posts that are interesting. So. I really quite enjoy the e-weekly. And I've been trying to get all this stuff in, hopefully <coughs> to get more people to come. So we've got Cher Latouz up in the top left. Uh, we've had her as a, a speaker here. She's an author with about local history as well. Um, she's a leading light down in the Newcastle District, Newcastle and District Historical, Historical Society. Society. Thank you, Roger. And um, she's going to be talking on UEL ancestors, hopefully how to do both do research, which would also, those methods would, all, would also help people with the late 1700s and early 1800s, the time of the UELs as well. And then what do you do with it when you've actually gotten your UEL ancestor? Tammy top right. We've had her at the Day of Learning a couple of years ago, I believe. So she's been a speaker at um, OGS conferences in the past, uh, and her topic is going to be dethorning, because she actually read what our theme was, dethorning um, interviews, cold calls, and first contact. Now, Jane McNamara is also well known to us because she has come and spoken at our, our branch several times. We generally get her, I think, at least once a year. And um, she has also presented at OGS conferences. This will be her first time at one of our day of learning, so that'll be nice. She's also an author. She's done quite a good book on inheritance in Ontario, and that's available through the OGS. 
Uh, her topics, and of course, my notes have gone too far down. She's going to talk about um, records of migration and settlement at the Archives of Ontario. Now, Jane is always at the Archives of Ontario. I swear she knows who to talk to, and they let her poke around in all those miscellaneous bundles of records. So this should be really interesting. I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. And then at our request, she's put together a brand new lecture on um, way beyond the guidebook, uh, planning a genealogy trip to the UK. And she's been over there many, many times. She's, uh, she, I've heard her lecture on like manor records in the early 1500s in England. She's really, really well versed in that topic. So I'm looking forward to that. Nancy. Okay. So here's a little bit bigger on our poster. October 9th is next Monday. You risk not getting a lunch if you don't register by then. And as Anne has just pointed out to me, she's brought forms. And if you don't have the money, she'll take the information and she'll send you a PayPal invoice that you can use with your credit card. Okay? We also have a few handouts here at the front of Bookmark and a couple of the posters if you want to take the details home with you. So we'd like to encourage you to come. The last four years have been really successful, so I, I really hope that uh, you will come. A little bit of OGS news. This is from the E-Weekly. Hopefully you saw it and it didn't go whizzing by you. My heritage is a, um, a really good company that has records, have hosts family trees, hosts family websites, and also does DNA. And they're very, very strong in European records and subscribers. So if you've got deep European roots, Eastern European, German, whatever, chances are pretty good you may make a contact through MyHeritage. And it's on for 50% off for new subscribers if you're an OGS member. Okay? It says, and friends. How do you get to be a friend of OGS? Well, you probably, <laughs> well maybe, I thought it had to be members only, but maybe it's any new person and if you notice it on the OGS website, you can just click through their link and they'll take you. Try it. Okay, and I got one more here. Vivid Picks Restore. Now this has been creating quite a bit of buzz in the genealogy community. And I picked up a copy in February when I was down at Roots Tech in Salt Lake City. It's wonderful. And if this works, I'm going to try and go on the internet and show you an example. We'll see. So on their website, they've got all sorts of tutorials on how to use it. That's what's come up on the left side. Right. Right. No, it hasn't. Try, try minimizing your PowerPoint, see if it's behind. Maybe getting in the way you're right. Don't close it. <laughs> well, the end show, this is, this is slide seven, so I move back to it easily. No, because I put it down. Oh. There we go. So, let's just make it bigger. Okay, so see the lovely picture at the top? That's the before. And that's the after.
And I don't know if you've tried to, to actually take photocopies or even digital copies of some of those darn microfilms, like land records and what have you. There's your before. And there's your after. I'm finding it very impressive. Nancy, is this a program that runs on your computer, or is it? Are you doing this over the internet and sending them your stuff? It runs on your computer. You pick your digital photograph. You click one button. They give you nine versions of the picture with slightly different controls behind it. You pick the one that you like best, and there it is. You also have the ability to do manual co controls. But I don't know about you, I don't have time to learn that. <laughs> and I hate, I fiddled around with uh, uh, Photoshop. How much does it cost? Well, let's go back to the PowerPoint and see if it actually specifies. Okay, so $49.99. $49.99. Yeah. U.S. U.S. Oh, oh. Yes. 20%. 20%. You, you save off. So then it's $39.99 That's right. $39.99 American. Well, I went to a conference in the States. I got it for a slightly better price than that. So I think it was around $30 U.S. cash on the barrel head. So, you know, you, you could spend four or $5,000 and well, it wouldn't be that much. You could spend maybe 2000 to go down, stay in a hotel, go to the conference, <laughs> just to buy vivid pics. <laughs> but anyway. So at this point, I'm sure you're anxiously waiting to hear Ruth because she's the star of the evening. I've known Ruth a long time. We won't say how long, Ruth, will we? I can't even figure it out. No, me neither, so that's another reason why I'm not saying. <laughs> but we've, we've um, you worked at, at some of the global displays, you taught some of the Toronto branch education courses, and I probably took every one you did. Um, so, without further ado, uh, I'm going to have Ruth come up, and maybe we should hand out the handouts. No, hang on. Hang on to it, but I let me told. Watch the cords. <laughs> okay. What we have to do is get this thing set up. Okay. So where is your plug in? Would you like the table a little further out so you no. can see the screen better? No, I can see it there. Oh, okay. <laughs> so we're going to talk about great grandma's grandchildren. Do you have it figured out who they are? Mm -hmm. Parents. Parents, aunts, and uncles. Or cousins. The children of your grandparents and their siblings. Don't forget, their, your grandparents probably had siblings too. Okay, are you still here with me? Yes. Your parents and others in your parents' generation. Got it. So, what we're really looking at, actually, is search strategies for the 20th, and now that we're nearly 20 years into the 21st century. So, what would we use? Well, there's all sorts of things. Census records, newspapers, Online family histories. Probably all the funerals that they had supplied flowers for. Well, no, all of them. Okay, because because they would find that people would come in wanting to order flowers, and they wouldn't remember what time the funeral was or whatever. So all the funeral homes automatically send to that store um, all those cards, and they paste them on the wall. Uh, so that when people come in, because they don't know who's going to come in, right? And so, so what do they in, do with the old ones? Well, 
the flower shop near us, so I pick them up. Dan picks them up or, or sometimes. And we've been bringing them in here, and um, uh, and Deb has been alphabetizing them. <laughs> so we've got we've got a, a stack of them, and then you know some someday in the future maybe a. Uh, when they're not, when they're old, <laughs> um, uh, a project might be to, to uh, digitize those or something. And Anne has actually digitized uh, anything that's been donated that are old ones. Yes. And they're up on our members only section. But but, but you can see it if you go the, to the funeral home board page. Yes. Uh, no, these would be like in the 1800s and stuff. 1800s, early 1900s. Okay. What we found is the funeral homes delete the the obituaries, yes. uh, the, the, they delete the information after a while, or some of the sometimes they send them off to a pay site. Yeah. Um, and so these ones are, yeah, at least one copy. <laughs> so you might not think to, to look at a flower shop for obituaries mm -hmm. and things. <laughs> yeah. Well, Bowmanville's interesting because um, King Street East, number one, they've got. <laughs> a window that has all the uh, obituaries for one funeral home. Across the road at 1 King Street West, <laughs> there's another window. It's got the other funeral homes <laughs> that you can end up in. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, another yeah. thing that I found in a newspaper that you might not expect is um, in the first issue of January, each year in the Bowmanville Statesman years ago, they would have a list of who was buried for the whole year in the in the Union Cemetery that we have there. Mm -hmm. That's what I was saying. You never know what you're going to find when you go looking. And so don't be afraid to look in what you might think is a weird and wonderful place. Um, I'm trying to find a German newspaper from Detroit. I've got the clipping of a death and that in German, and I, I'm sure I've looked before, and I can't find the name of the paper. I've just got the clipping. So would I go Google? Would I go Cindy's List, maybe? Or I don't know. I, I, I might, don't know the I name might of the paper. get in touch with a with a genealogy group in Detroit. Okay. <laughs> we'll just yeah, the, the Burton. The Burton. I've tried that. Did you try the Burton Library? Burton Room. Yeah. yeah okay. No, I haven't. But if you put, type in part of the exact phrase from the oh, yeah. in quotations yes. okay, into yeah. Google, yes. you, you might it might pick it up. You it, never know. It might be online. Yeah, yeah if it's online, oh, it might that grab it from the yeah. quotation. Okay, wait. One, two, it was the third one. Oh. <laughs> what was the first? A genealogy society. Oh, the group. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. Genealogy group for Detroit. Or so put the yeah. exact phrase oh, okay. with the uh, you know do 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 beside it. Like the Burton. The Burton. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions for Ruth? Just a comment. I found one of my great grandma's grandchildren through the DNA tests that we had done. Yeah. You know, came up on GenMatch, and I want to reiterate my commercial for everybody to put their information on GenMatch and to make it free to those people who have access. Because people are doing projects on not identifying murderers, but identifying murderees. Mm -hmm. And at the present time, my nephew's working on a project where some serial killer killed, I think, 24 people. Mm -hmm. And four of them are still unidentified or he killed 28 and four are unidentified. Mm -hmm. So for the one murderer we have, we have a total of 24 or 28 murderees, four of whom we would like to identify. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, so I, 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 about identifying murderers. That's yeah. not the yeah. purpose. This is to put other people's what did you want us to do? What do you want us to do? We want to know who the victims are. What do want you your DNA do? results in GenMatch? Yeah, and, and also oh, are, put yeah. it on GenMatch. Make sure that it's that it's open to the people to look at it because they change the rule. Oh, you check off that thing. Yeah. Check oh, yeah. it off. Yeah, there's a little police badge, and you click on it. That's right. Check yeah. it off. Yeah. After our last DNA meeting, I went home and and did it. And did it. Right. Yeah. Because I thought mine already was, and and it's not. And it wasn't. So I I went in and redid it. Thank you. Yeah. That's 
Okay. It's probably mine. Oh dear. It's over here. It's over here. It's in your pocket. No, it's in his. The purse on the floor. No, it's underneath the. If whoever, if whoever it is was very, very <laughs> persistent. persistent. Yeah. And, and considering only about six people know that phone number. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably the TELUS company wanting to tell me I get a discount. <laughs> oh yeah, dream on it. Yeah, sure. Yeah, they're, they're phoning to announce they just upped your rates. It's more like it. Uh, okay. okay, so Can I say something yes, about LinkedIn yeah. since you mentioned that. Sure. Um, one problem that I don't belong to LinkedIn, and one of the reasons I don't is because when you join LinkedIn, if you have a um, on your computer um, a list of uh, contacts on your email, um, it will go and it'll find that, and it'll send multiple requests to all everybody you know to join LinkedIn. Only if you ask it to. Uh, I'm a member of LinkedIn. I've well, never. But I, 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 I always write back. And I've only found one person that ever said they did that. The other people said they had no idea. No, no, it's when, when, you're, when you're setting up your profile, it says something about, can we search? And it's... You probably have to specifically tell it not to. No, no, you have to. No. And, but it, yeah. it, it's something that you can easily click on by mistake. Yeah. And I've never had a problem with it. But it, yeah. And it is a good if you're looking for business people. That must be how I got yeah. So do any of you get a message from me telling you to join LinkedIn? Because I... Because I've got a number of you in my email database. <laughs> yeah, I, I, people in my list haven't, so I mustn't, mustn't have clicked the right yeah. wrong thing. <laughs> exactly. Uh, okay, we need to hand out the... Yeah, the handouts. Handouts. And we're going to take a break now. Okay. And don't trip over all these silly cords. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Don't forget the 50 50 drawing. Yeah. Okay, um, so for the treasurer's report for September, uh, we had $400.97 withdrawals, $20 deposits. And our current balance is $2,404.97. Thank you. And we'll go on to B with the correspondence. We've got two to tell us about. Two. 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 Lost. Two. Two. Okay. I don't think I need that. Um, but I'll come on here just in case. Um, what I do is I read out ones that have come in, usually by via the um, the internet uh, and our our um, actual uh, email. The first one uh, came in September sixth uh, from a David Balsty. I'm an Australian researcher enlisted to assist the research of relatives and of Australian soldiers killed during the Battle of Fromelies in France, 1916. Um, he is actually looking for English-born soldier named Benjamin Richardson from Suffolk, England. His immediate family seems to have vanished from the area. We believe they came to your part of Ontario, though we don't have a lot to go on. He goes on to give um, the siblings as George, 1888 to 1917, died fighting for Canada, 139th Battalion, a single farmer from Camelford, Ontario, born Vauxhall, Suffolk, England, and he has his military record. William, 1891, married Bessie Millward in Brock, 1923. Robert, 1903 to 1998, married Bessie Waitling, 1903 to 1992, in Suffolk, 1926. Uh, he believes Robert and Bessie lived in Cresswell near Oakwood and are buried in Sunderlands. Uh, there's also Jane, uh, 1895, and Arthur, 1897. Nothing known about them. Any assistance would be appreciated. Um, the next one came in September 18th, and um, it comes from Barbara Phillips. Uh, her husband and her were recently visited the cemetery and found graves for three of their ancestors, Nicholas, William Sr., and William Jr. Phillips, and some other family members. 
I wonder if some other family members, i.e. daughters who married and maybe under different surnames can also be in the cemetery. Any help would be appreciated. What cemetery? Beside Scott Cemetery, sorry. It's oh, at the top of the name. Yeah. 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 That's the Scott Township. Okay. Uh, OGS webinar coming up Thursday night. It's Digging Deeper with City Directories, presented by Michael Strauss. He's quite a character. I've met him down at Roots Tech. Steve submitted these two. Um, the FamilyTreeWebinars.com, which is an offshoot of Legacy Family Tree uh, Company, and of course is now owned by my heritage, has two DNA ones. You'll notice the date of the first one. It's today. <laughs> I think it may even have been this afternoon. It's hard to say. But remember, these ones, this company, uh, puts the recording up for free for about six days. So you've got a chance to go in and listen to the recording. Okay, and Diane Southard is doing tomorrow. And she's an excellent speaker. You'll really like that one. A day out with your DNA, I think that's an interesting one. And in fact, Diane Southard is going to be up at Toronto Branch on October 18th and 19th. Of course, it's the same day as our day of learning, unfortunately. Um, doing DNA um, stuff for the Toronto branch. So that's, she'll be a good speaker for them. Uh, next year's conference is called Vision 2020, Finding the Past, Moving into the Future, Hamilton. And June 5 to 7, so keep the dates clear. I just noticed in the genealogy news that NBC is going to have a new ancestry show. Um, from the request from so many people of wanting to not just see celebrities, they wanted to see ordinary people. So apparently, this is what it's going to be about. Um, and it's included, the best I could find was it was included in the Saturday NBC morning programming block called The More You Know, starting this Saturday, coming. So we have, you have to find NBC on your TV, which has taken an hour and a half going through all those time <laughs> channels. <laughs> that long. <laughs> yeah. Our upcoming meetings. Uh, November, we've got Ted Barris, that is always full, full, full. He's talking about, his dad was a um, medical, in a medical unit, so he's uh, going to talk to us about military medical units from the Boer War right up to Korea. So that should be interesting. And you'll notice we're having our annual elections that day, too. Okay. And I really would like to urge someone, some buddies, to come forward because we do need new ideas on the council. And hey, we're, I think we're pretty fun people to get to know, you know. So come on out, um, volunteer. You don't have to have any form with ten signatures. Let me tell you, all you have to do is twitch. <laughs> we'll take you. And I know that Joyce is looking for uh, speakers and topics so that she can go searching for our programming for the winter spring. So please talk to any of us or Joyce. Stick your hand up, Joyce. And uh, give us your ideas of what you'd like to hear from speakers. And preferably from, uh, up to about March or April around this area because you never know when there's going to be a snowstorm. And yeah, uh, that happened to us last April. We, we had uh, Bob Dawes coming from Quinty and he couldn't make it. And fortunately Anne stepped in with her talk about family reunions. So the DNA Special Interest Group is the third Wednesday, so that's October 16th up on the, I call it the third floor. But anyway, in the boardroom, board yes. Tower. Pardon? The tower. The tower. Okay, is that what we're calling it? Okay. And 
Steve, you're just going to do a little thing on the IGI. Does anybody remember the IGI? Yes. I think it's over here. This kind of came about because we were talking about it at our last executive meeting, and some of us did not know it was still around. So, in its present form, I'm going to throw that in there because there's a couple of a caveat there, I guess. It has changed a certain amount. It should okay. say remember under the heart. Boy, you've got a lot of stuff on there. Yeah, i got to clean them off. We took remember the IGI. There. there we are. Unfortunately, I do not have a pointer that's well, working with this new one. It's, it's pretty straightforward. Okay. There we go. Slide show. Right in the Okay. Thank you. Okay. And, and how many have been doing genealogy long enough that they remember the IGI and that's what their first go to thing was? <laughs> And just about everybody, okay, so that's good. You have an idea with them, and that's what I forgot to bring down. I was going to bring down samples from upstairs. We actually have the, the IGI for Mexico up there. Shall I go get one? No, it's not important. But it looks like a microfiche. Okay, so it what, what looks is a lot like one of these. They were all black <laughs> and everything like that. I have a clear one further on. But, Tell them uh, what the IGI, IGI stands for. Stands for, well, Okay, well, we're not, we're squished. What happened? Um, it's all on the screen here, but... It's, it's the projector. Just the projector? Yeah, I, you can't do anything. I can't do anything? Okay. <laughs> it st IGI stands for the International Genealogical Index, for those who don't know. It was a massive computer file created by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and uh, it uh, started in 1973. So before internet, before just about everything, and continued to grow through 2008. It contained community contributed, which means our family trees, our books, things like that, and community index records, which could have been parish records or census records or things like that. And uh, nowadays, the index data that was part of the IGI has been organized into its original source correct collections from which it was transcribed and it now resides in the historical records system. So England church records or miscellaneous church records or that type of thing. They've actually taken a lot of the community index records and put them back into the system, into the current system but under a different name. This is just a quick timeline, and I'm going to read it. I'm not sure where yet. But it started with 20 million names in 1973. Okay, that's what's cut off, so I'll have to read it from here. By 1975, they had 34 million names. I thought this was interesting, except this is very small. <laughs> 1981, 81 million entries. 1984, 108 million. Uh, 1988, 147 million. 1992, 187 million names. Um, and so on. It just kept expanding up to March or May 1999. It had two, roughly 285 million entries, but they were released by region when it went onto the internet. So that's the, when the family search came on. 285 million entries, but it was released slowly. But just imagine that many names. It is worldwide, so you're not all in one area, but it, it uh, that was a lot of names. And originally, it, the idea behind it was to have one record per person, or, or like one birth record per person, one marriage record per person. They weren't supposed to have duplication of it at all, but they couldn't handle that and eventually duplication crept in. Uh, the usefulness. It was very helpful for relocating potential records for research, especially before we got the internet. 
You could order microfilms from Salt Lake City in or contact different repositories. Anywhere, it'd give you clues where to go looking for those records. And you'd write a letter, <laughs> send it off to, we'll say, the Hudson's Bay Company archives, and hopefully they'd answer you with the, the information. You could also meet and find cousins there from the uh, con community contributed records. So it was quite the beautiful set of records. Drawbacks, it had virtually no death records. They uh, did have up to, I believe it was eight years old, if they could determine that that was the age of the child. But a lot of the early records, of course, didn't give an age. So unless it was matched to somebody's baptism close at the on the same page or something, often you didn't get the death records. We made a lot of assumptions on the available records. If a whole bunch of children from John Smith and Jane were listed there and they're in the same parish, we kind of thought, okay, maybe they're all from the same family. We're going to lump them all together for now. So it did lead to a lot of mistakes, but it was, uh, it was all we had available. And uh, same with the community contributed records. That's, and that goes for even the records out there today. They're only as good as the person doing them and what records they have tried to look at. This is just the page for the, one page of the Clottons from Yorkshire. They were split into different counties for England. You can see this is page 24,636. And this is, goes from John Clotton and then starts with Joseph Clotton. And you can see there's a marriage to Mary Berry. There's a christening, and uh, this, this would probably be the father here, William Cotton, his son, 1734 or so, in Weasley Parish. Then Nathaniel Cotton had a son, John. Uh, this is a marriage to a Stevenson. That type of thing. You get marriages, you get baptisms, births, and they were lumped together a lot like this all by name, so you'd have to go through every page of the Clottons to try and pick out the whole family, which is why I have orange dots all over trying to find, okay, Joseph was a father here, so I, I color-coded everybody trying to f figure everybody out. And uh, you had lots of fun, but you could full cut or print off these pages for a small fee and take them home and, and work from home. That part was great because it, it allowed you to search the whole of Yorkshire for a certain surname, especially if you had an unusual one like Clotten. What are the little numbers on the ends? At this end, this has to do with the uh, church sealing and baptisms and things like that. Those are dates that they were done. I cannot remember exactly. And then here, I believe, is the batch number or film number that the record came from. So this was helpful. You could trace it back to a certain microfilm, order in that microfilm and see the original record. So it did have potential that way. And like I say, it was before the internet for most of it, so this is what you had to work with. And it was great. Now, to locate it present day, go to familysearch.org and sign in. You have to sign in, but it's a free registration. Uh, then once you're signed in, click on search, which is across the top of the page here. They're, this is their logo right here, and then you go across here. So you just click on search. Uh, once you've hit search, you get a drop-down menu. Go to records, or if you want to bypass it, just go to regular setup. It's down the side of the page as well or you can actually click on different places in the map, but that won't take you to the IGI, that just takes you to the regular search. Okay, once you've done that, go down to find a collection at the bottom of the page, because this is the page that comes up from, from records, and type in IGI, either in brackets, if you don't want to wade through a lot, or type in the whole International Genealogical Index, um, because if you type in just IGI without the brackets, you'll still get it, but you'll get another dozen things to wade through as well. So it's quicker to put the brackets on it. But 
that will bring up the actual page to search through the collection. You have a choice of opting in or out of the community index and the community contributed uh, part of the IGI. And then you can put in their names, marriage, birth, residence, death, that type of thing. And then just search. Francis Lakey, Devonshire, England. I just put in a simple one there just for a search. And I got nothing. <laughs> so I went to Smith in England. <laughs> and we got 355 in the contributed IGI, but not in the indexed. So most of those index records have been moved over back into English records as opposed in, in with the births and marriages and that type of thing as opposed to staying on the IGI. They're gone. Now some of them must be still there or they wouldn't even have that category I'm sure. But they have moved out what they could back into the whole main part of the, uh, the setup. But you get the name, you get the residence. Um, get the parents in this case this was a birth about that and then 1841 1851 that sounds like a census doesn't it in England so that gives you an idea of the record and when you click on this that will take you to more information for the record so you can elaborate on this sometimes it's just from someone's uh, family chart or group sheet family group sheet or something like that so there may or may not be additional information available it all depends again residence 1851 that sounds like a census for that part of it but it does have a death date so that's presumably off a family group sheet but this is what we used to use as most of you have experienced and you can still do some stuff with it and presumably you still have links to some of the people that are researching some of these names that contributed their their family charts so, in uh, conclusion, it's not nearly as useful as it used to be, but it still could be a source, especially for uh, cousins or something, or even some records that aren't documented anywhere else. It'll give you some clues, if nothing else. Let's use it for clues. Don't treat it as gospel. And beware, use with caution, because most of it is family charge, so it could be wrong. <laughs> Steve? Yep. Why wouldn't they have moved over the parts that aren't family charts? Well, they, I think they did originally, but they're taking it back out and merging it with, because they're, uh, they're like yes. parish records that they've extracted information from, that's a, a basic project they have going for their, their regular part of the uh, FamilySearch.org. So they've just moved it back because it was transcribed from records and it still should be accurate. accurate excuse me. Yeah, the index stuff, they did huge indexing projects. Well, I, I, like you saw those numbers, like yeah. 80 million at, near the start. And double check. So they index twice and, and double check. And compare the two, yeah. Yeah, uh, so it's always excellent indexing from family search, which is all the best. I got to make a comment about the uh, community contributed ones. I have a family of Burns. Lanark County, three Walters in a row. Senior son, those two born in Scotland, the third one born in Ontario. And whoever contributed had the father married to the son's wife. So <laughs> they'd squish the three Walters into two. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's just, yeah. you know, it's just like you know the stuff on Ancestry now. <laughs> And the mistakes are even worse now. <laughs> I think so. it's, a, it's a guy to use with caution. Yeah. Is, yes. the, is the Mexican information you have in English or in Spanish? I've never looked at it, to be honest. I assume they're Spanish names, uh, um, but it should be laid out as, you know, births or marriages and that type of thing, so presumably. Okay. Uh, but again, you could probably pick up the exact same thing on FamilySearch.org. Um, but you're welcome to look at it. We do have a fish machine that's it. Oh, my grandson is Henry. Henry, yes. <laughs> okay, so the brick wall bomb, I think we have to 
go quickly past that. Uh, this is our contact information. <coughs> and our next meeting is Tuesday, November 5th, here, somewhere in the basement, probably. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, I hope everybody comes back. Yeah. And the meeting. Next month, maybe it'll be fixed. Huh? We can hope. Yeah, and oh, and 10? 50-50 Oh, you really want to know who's won the 50-50? You're -50? not leaving. You're not leaving. <laughs> <laughs> Sheila. Okay. Actually, I've, I've lost that slide. It must oh. be in, in the old computer. Oh, no. Okay, our prize is $16.50 tonight. Very good. Since our speaker has left, <laughs> the mini speaker will reside. Manage this. Yes.